Our next speaker is Dr. Todd Humphreys, an assistant professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics. He received his PhD at Cornell University and joined the Cockrell School of Engineering in the fall of 2009. Dr. Humphreys is the director of the Radio Navigation Laboratory, where software-defined GPS receivers are developed, and he co-founded Coherent Navigation, a startup that focuses on Iridium navigation and GPS security. He specializes in the application of optimal estimation techniques to problems in satellite navigation, uh, orbital and altitude dynamics, and signal processing. Also, he focuses on defending against intentional GPS spoofing and jamming, which he heavily spoke about at, as a subject at the TED Talk he went to in 2012. Please join us now in welcoming Dr. Humphreys. Okay, I'd like you to think forward to the time, the first time you step into an autonomous self-driving car. Or if you think you'll never do that in your lifetime, imagine the day that you receive your first package delivered by an Amazon drone. You look up and the, the delivery comes. You're probably going to be asking yourself in a moment like that, do I really trust my life to this system? Can I trust my life to this for the next 15 minutes or so? And you might realize that many people have spent a lot of time making this, these systems fault tolerant or robust in, the term, in terms of control. But what you might not know is that currently these autonomous systems aren't terribly good at defending against fraud. That is, they're not very good at defending against legitimate, uh, deliberate hackers. And as, as we've learned over the past, last couple of years, fraud is different from faults, and outliers are different from outlaws. And so we, our science has to deal with the kind of strategic adversaries that will be out there trying to mess with our autonomous cars, trying to mess with our autonomous drones. The uh, research that I've been doing in the laboratory, our radio navigation laboratory, over the last couple of years has been focusing on this notion of autonomous control system security. What if the physical system you're trying to control is being manipulated by hackers. Maybe there's physical manipulation, this A5 here. Maybe it's that they have supplanted the signals you get back from your sensors with false signals. Or maybe they've broken the link entirely. And on the control end, maybe they've substituted your control commands with something uh, fictitious. Or they've broken your control loop. In any of these cases, you've got problems, of course, on your hand. And as you look at this diagram, you might say, well, what can be done? The truth is, the general secure control problem is insoluble. So everyone is looking for smaller problems that we can solve, something more constrained. And in our laboratory, the constraints that we're interested in have to do with the mechanism by which you generate the attack. Instead of just considering an arbitrary cyber-physical cyber attack, we're looking at attacks that are generated by so-called field uh, disturbances. We call these field attacks. These are attacks on the physical fields that your sensors are built to be sensitive to. So you might have an acoustic attack or, or a, an electromagnetic attack, etc. Let me give you an illustration of this. This is the Deepwater Horizon before the big accident in, uh, in 2010. And it's held over its riser pipe, not by any kind of anchor down to the seabed, but by dynamic positioning. And this is a GPS concept where you simply uh, control the device, control this ship basically with pontoons that are actuating below to keep things about one, well, about 10 centimeters in diameter around that riser pipe. Otherwise, if you get too far off the riser pipe, you rip it out of, the, out of its moorings. But if I were to take a, a boat and a few graduate students today into the Gulf of Mexico and I found another one of these deep water drilling rigs, I could do the following. I could spoof its GPS receivers, which are being used to locate it over this riser pipe, and simultaneously jam its backup system, which is an acoustic system based on signals from the seabed floor. 
by dropping maybe um, uh, a, micro a, a speaker into the water and playing Led Zeppelin or something like that. After doing these two things, I could convince this platform that it was drifting ever so slowly off to the left, say. And its response would be to drift to the right, to right itself over the riser pipe. And the, res the result could be that it rips itself off of its riser pipe. All of this could be done from a distance with simply electromagnetic and, and acoustic signals. So this is an example of a coordinated attack against a, a GNSS and acoustic system. Even though the designers had developed this to be fault tolerant, it's not fraud tolerant. It's not tolerant against outlaws. Back in 2011, there was a loss of one of our most uh, sophisticated spy planes over Iran. And at the time, people began calling me because the Iranians were claiming this had been done by GPS spoofing. And since they knew our laboratory was interested in spoofing, they asked, well, could they really have done this? I didn't know at the time. And I scratched my, heads and asked my head, head and asked my students, do you suppose a spoofing attack could really bring down a UAV? Well, we decided to test that idea. Uh, this is what the Iranians showed on state television just weeks after they made their claim. The fact that it came down intact means that the U.S. claims that it was just a malfunction are also somewhat dubious. Right now, I can't say whether it was a full spoofing attack or not, but I've elevated my uh, evaluation from uh, terribly implausible to at least remotely, remotely plausible. We did some analysis and found that, yes, it's not much more than eighth grade geometry to figure out how to delay the GPS signals and align them just the right way so that they would arrive at a target indistinguishable from the authentic signals coming down from the satellites. And with a little bit of preparation on our part, we were able to do an experiment where we carried out with this device, an $80,000 UAV, uh, a trial to see if we could fool it when it was hovering in midair and convince it was rising upward. In response, its autopilot system would have uh, the, the, uh, the counter effect of bringing it downward. So we did this. Uh, we practiced it in the football stadium. In fact, they moved football practice for us one morning in 2012, which for us was the biggest miracle of all here. <laughs> My students and I gathered here in the field, and we set the UAV to hover. And then we brought out our homebrew software-defined radio platform that generates GPS signals that look very much like the ones coming down from the satellite. You see, part of the problem here is that the original GPS signals were never encrypted those that are used for civilian uh, uses were not encrypted with the same sort of encryption that the military signals enjoy. So the vast majority of applications across the globe are tapping into these open access civilian signals, as was our UAV that morning. After doing our attack, we, uh, we convinced the UAV as it was flying in the stadium that it was going upward, it, f it came downward toward the pitch and was caught by our safety pilot. Just a week later, we took this show on the road down to White Sands and were invited by the Department of Homeland Security to generate the attack in, under their noses. We did the same thing for them and demonstrated that we had three-dimensional control over the UAV, not just up and down, but we could go any direction. In fact, afterward, we got curious. What can you do after you've captured one of these devices? I mean, using a GPS spoofer is a bit like having a tractor beam. You can fool with its sense of location, and so its autopilot does the work for you. What could we do stealthily without setting off any alarms was one of the questions we asked. Well, if you've got a UAV that's just doing a square pattern in the sky, like many of them do, or a circular pattern, all you have to do as an attacker, if you want to remain stealthy, is to memorize the general trend of what they're doing, what the UAV is doing, and then make your attack mimic that with a little bit of a twist. So if you'd like to make it move southeast, you continue the square pattern, you just drag the pattern southeast. And that way, its inertial measurement unit, combined with its GPS sensor, is not able to tell any kind of telltale difference between its quiescent state and the attack state. Over here on the right, we have a standard statistical measure on the outputs of its internal Kalman filter that says, I can't tell that anything is going wrong. That's when these attacks are most sinister, when they are stealthy and effective. Of course, it's easier to crash than it is to control. And after one of the uh, experiments that we were using to get data for a paper we wanted to publish, we found that 
This was the outcome of our experiment. I remember the fate, faith, fateful last words I said just before this happened was, well guys, that seemed to work well. Let's try to be more aggressive. <laughs> and we were. I was telling this story last uh, year at South by Southwest, and afterward this distinguished looking English gentleman comes up to me with a nice accent and hands me his card and he said, how would you like to go after larger prey? And I said, well, what do you have in mind? He said, I am the captain of that ship. And I looked down on the business card. It looks like a fairly small ship to me. It turns out it's the White Rose of Drax. I didn't know what the White Rose of Drax was, but he assured me that it was large enough for our experiment. Two months later, we're there on the White Rose of Drax. It's an $80 million super yacht. Super yachts are those that are larger than about 35 meters. It's 65 meters long. And the owner, uh, a British real estate mogul, had agreed to allow us to do our experiment on his super yacht. He gifted it to us for two weeks <laughs> so that we could carry out this. This is extraordinary kinds of interactions that you get only at South by Southwest, I maintain. <laughs> I went this year also and I said uh, that we had done this attack and guess what? A fellow who owns an airplane has now contacted me and wants us to do an attack against his airplane. Anyhow, here we are aboard the White Rose, my student Jashan Bati and I, and the captain and his, uh, and his friend who drag, drug him to, uh, to South by Southwest. Our goal here was to carry out another, a, a similar kind of field attack against this device, and we did so as it was passing by the Isle of, of Giglio, just off the west coast of Italy. Now you might know this, uh, this island because it's famous for being the wrecking place of the Costa Concordia. This set ended up being a fitting backdrop for our experiment. The Costa Concordia ran up on the rocks when its captain lost his sense of navigation. Our experiment attacked the, the navigation system on the ship, most particularly the, the GPS-derived navigation coordinates, but also was trying to be stealthy, not caught by any of the other sensors on the bridge. And we were successful at this. This is what it looked like on the sun deck, and this is my student, Jashan, actually carrying out the attack. He likes to joke nowadays that he uh, told the captain, I'm the captain now. <laughs> The attack ended up working by pushing the sense of the ship's position off to starboard. Its autopilot, or the captain, corrected to maintain itself, the, the ship on the rum line, and thereby we were able to induce an error in the heading that was indistinguishable from the original sensor outputs. So it wasn't detected. No alarms went off in the bridge. There was nothing wrong. The, the, caps, the captain and his crew were, uh, were long-faced trying to figure out how they would detect this in the open seas if this were really a pirate attack. This proves that we were doing an attack because it claims that the altitude of the ship is 415 meters below the surface, and this is us going through the Corinth Canal in Greece. We're off by about a kilometer off up on the land. And just to finish off, this is the view from the back end of the ship. As we've carried off our attack, we've delivered this uh, this stealthy attack on the ship, and the, the captain and his crew were able to feel, all of us felt the ship move, but no alarms went off. And when looking off the, the stern, you could see the bend in the wake that was caused by a simple change in the electromagnetic signals sucked in by those antennas on the front of the ship. So the moral here is that there are a host of problems that cyber-physical systems are going to be facing as we move toward a time when we can trust them with our lives. I was later called to testify before Congress about these uh, UAV attacks, and they asked me point blank, do you believe it's wise for us to introduce unmanned aerial vehicles into the national airspace? And my response at the time, and I, and I still agree, agree with it, is that not, an, uh, not until we can be sure that we have accurate positioning, navigation, and timing, because that's the bedrock of the way that they're going to navigate through the airspace and that's the way that they can safely cohabit with manned aircraft, with commercial aircraft. Thank you. <laughs>